Hey guys, it's James here and I'm glad to see you here today. If you're in the recording or music industry, you might have encountered these room frequency response graphs in newsletters or forums. In this video, I'm going to show you how to properly read these graphs and what some of the most important elements are when analyzing and comparing frequency response graphs. This is not supposed to be a comprehensive guide, nor would it be super technical, but rather I want to equip you with the necessary knowledge to uh, not be misled when you are analyzing the frequency response of your own room or when you see these graphs used in marketing materials. The first and most important thing when it comes to interpreting a frequency response graph is you have to pay attention to the X and Y axes because they dictate how the graph is displayed. The X axis shows you the frequencies. From left to right is low frequencies to high frequencies, just like the X axis in an EQ plugin. The Y axis shows you the sound pressure level or SPL of the frequencies, or for the sake of simplicity, you can think of it as how loud the frequencies are. So if we look at this graph, you can see that it's showing you the frequency response between 50 Hertz and 20 kilohertz. And the SPL is from 40 decibel to 85 decibel, which is a range of 45 decibel. Ideally, what people want in their room is a frequency response that is flat or whose peaks and nulls aren't too drastic like this. Now, the Y axis is what can really change how the graph looks. In fact, I just intentionally misled you to prove my point. The much flatter graph I just showed you is actually the same as the first graph, which appears to be worse but it's not. Take a look at them again. These are the exact same frequency response, just displayed differently. The reason why they can look so different is because their Y axes are set up differently. You see, in this graph, the Y axis has a range of 45 decibel, while the other one has a range of 165 decibel. This means that one is more zoomed in vertically than the other, therefore making the peaks and dips much more pronounced. Here, you can see how adjusting the zoom level of the Y axis affects the flatness of the graph. Neglecting or not understanding the Y axis in a frequency response graph is probably the most common mistake people make when they first dabble into room acoustics. I often come across posts like this online where the person posted their first room measurement result and the graph looks like a smooth line. But if you look at the Y axis, it's completely zoomed out with a range of almost 400 decibel. Once the person readjusted the Y axis to about 60 decibels in range, you can see that his room is anything but flat. Similarly, when I first tried to measure my old studio six years ago, you can see that I also made this, uh, the same mistake of having the Y axis set to a range of 360 decibels, which make the frequency response appear to be pretty flat but it's really not. I want to emphasize that generally speaking, in order to compare different frequency responses in a fair manner, you need to make sure that the ranges of both the Y axis and the X axis to be exactly the same. For example, take a look at these two graphs. Even though in both graphs, the Y axis have the same five decibel increment. So in this one is 60, 50, 70, and in the other one is also 60, 50, 70, 75, and so on. They look like two completely different frequency responses. And to people who aren't familiar with reading these graphs, they will think one room has a better response than the other when in reality, they're literally the same measurement with just different range settings on the Y axis. The reason for this is simple. Even though the Y axis in both graphs have five decibel increments, the number of increments on the axes are different. On this one, because the range is 40 to 85, the Y axis only contains nine of those five decibel increments. In comparison on the other one, because the range is much bigger, spanning from negative 20 decibel all the way to 145 decibel, the Y axis consists of 33 of those five decibel increments. Fitting so many more increments on the Y axis obviously means that the distance between each increment is much smaller. As a result, the frequency response with uh, more increments on the Y axis will look flatter, just like what we are seeing here. It's actually not quite important for two graphs to have the same Y axis scale for them to be a fair comparison, as long as the range is the same and linear, meaning each increment is the same. Scale just refers to units the axis is divided into. So in this graph we discussed, the Y axis is divided into nine five decibel increments, 
and so the y-axis scale is 5 decibel and is linear. When the range is the same, the scale doesn't actually change how the frequency response is displayed. For example, these two graphs from the same frequency response have different scales. One has a 5 decibel scale and the other one 1 decibel scale. But when I overlap them, you can see that the graphs are completely identical. You can see why it's so incredibly crucial to pay attention to the y-axis when you analyze frequency response graphs, but also how easy it is to be misled by comparisons that do not share the same range on the y-axis. The x-axis is much more straightforward and has a lower chance to cause confusion simply because it's obvious when it's zoomed in or zoomed out. But you still need to pay attention to it. For example, these two graphs look very different, but they're actually from the same frequency response. If you look at the x-axis, you'll notice that this one is only showing the frequency range from 84 hertz to 1 kilohertz, while the other one only shows 900 hertz to about 13 kilohertz. Aside from the x and y axes, another thing that can drastically change the appearance of the frequency response is smoothing. Without boring you with the technical details, smoothing basically makes it easier to see the trends or analyze the frequency response. For example, this is what the frequency response of a room looks like without any smoothing. You can see that from the mid frequencies and up, it's pretty much impossible to analyze it. Once I applied the 148th smoothing, which is a very small amount, it immediately becomes much easier to see what's going on. However, as you smooth the graph more and more, it becomes less and less truthful, uh, you could say, and more and more forgiving when it comes to the flaws. For instance, if you compare these two graphs, one looks like a disaster and the other one looks pretty decent. But they're actually the same frequency response with just different smoothing settings. So next time when you see a flat looking frequency response graph from someone else, find out what smoothing was used before feeling impressed by it. Generally speaking, I personally think anything smoother than 1 24th is just unnecessary. If your goal is to troubleshoot and analyze your room's acoustics, 1 24th smoothing or even 1 48th is very, very usable. Now let's take a look at two types of misleading comparisons I have personally come across before. So you can spot them if you see them in the future. In this first example, the left frequency response might look worse than the right one at a glance, but let's pay attention to the two axes. In the left graph, the y-axis goes from 55 to 100, which is a range of 45 decibels. In the right graph, the y-axis goes from 45 to 115, which is a range of 70 decibels. This means that the peaks and dips in the left graph will look much more drastic than the ones in the right graph. What's more, the x-axis in these two graphs are not the same. The frequency range the left graph is showing is 50 to 20 kilohertz, whereas the right graph is 50 to 500 hertz. So you're looking at just a portion of the frequency response here. This is the second example of a misleading comparison. It appears that the right graph has much less peaks and nulls in the frequency response, so you might think it's better than the left, which looks quite messy, and it even looks like it's giving you two middle fingers here. I swear to God, that is not deliberate. Okay, now we check their X and Y axes. They look exactly identical. The ranges are the same for both. So is this a fair comparison? No, because although it's not super obvious, you can tell by how much fewer peaks and nulls the right graph has that it probably has a different smoothing setting. We can't really know what the exact setting is just by looking at the graph, but that doesn't really matter because all we need to know here is that this is not a one-to-one -one comparison. For reference, this is what the right graph looks like with the same smoothing setting as the left graph. And if we overlap these two, you can see that the right graph actually shows a worse frequency response than the other one, especially in the 4 to 10K range. Now, in some cases, you can actually still figure out which frequency response is a better one, even if it isn't a one-to-one -one comparison. Let's take this misleading comparison we already looked at as an example. We have already identified that both the y-axis and the x-axis have different ranges, so the graphs are displayed differently. There are two steps to comparing the data correctly in this case. First, 
because we only have data up to 500 hertz in the right graph, we need to disregard the data above 500 hertz in the left graph since there's nothing to compare it to. Then we should find the highest peak and the lowest dip in each graph within the 50 to 500 hertz range, calculate their differences and compare the differences. The one with the smaller difference usually means it's better. Not always, but it's definitely desired. So in the left graph, the highest peak is at around 88 decibel and the lowest dip is around 73 decibel. This means that the peak to dip difference is 15 decibels. We'll do the same thing on the right graph. The highest peak is at around 89 decibel and the lowest dip is around 73 decibel. This makes the peak to dip difference to be 16 decibels. So one is actually not really better than the other, at least not in this range we can compare. I hope this video gives you the necessary knowledge to properly interpret frequency response graphs and to prevent yourself from being misled when you are testing your own room or when you come across these graphs from other sources. If you want to know more about room acoustics, I actually have a video where I talk about treating this studio. Uh, how I built some of my acoustic panels and how desk reflections affect the sound. I'll put the video in a corner here and in the description if you're interested. Don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe if you want uh, more music production content. Happy mixing and I'll see you next time.